a person who had read a lot of Dharma books, once came to see a John Fu and told him about her practice. She kept watch on her mind, she said, in any time a defilement appeared, she would uproot it. And the John Fuang said, watch out. Sometimes while you're uprooting it, it bears fruit and drops a seed and grows into another defilement. What he meant was that sometimes we get so absorbed in a particular technique or a particular approach that we don't notice the defilement sort of growing up around that approach. This is particularly true if we think that we've found a technique that's going to guarantee discernment. For example, the idea that simply by developing mindfulness, being perfectly equanimous, noting whatever comes up, is automatically going to guarantee discernment. And you can get very good at maintaining a state of equanimity. And of course you get really get attached to that equanimity. To the point where you get people nowadays saying that equanimity is nirvana. For some reason this issue has come up quite a lot in the past two months. There was even one Dharma teacher who went over to Burma a couple months back, took along his latest Dharma book and went to see a psychic one of the psychic just to hold his book, to see what message she could get from the book. And she told him, you're confusing equanimity with nirvana. And as the Buddha points out, you can be thoroughly attached to equanimity. Then it's still a form of clinging, still a form, a form of attachment, a form of suffering. Very subtle, but it's there. But if you spend your time noticing everything else, you're going to miss it. Or looking at things in terms of the three characteristics. I was reading a book a while back saying that other perceptions come under the five aggregates of clinging, and therefore a form of suffering. But for some reason they were saying that the, the perception of inconstancy, stress, and not-self don't count as a form of suffering, therefore that you can't really cling to them. But again, the Buddha pointed out that you can develop these perceptions, and they'll lead you to a very subtle state of concentration. And if no further discernment arises, there you are, you're stuck on that concentration. Or the idea that simply doing jhana will guarantee, discernment will guarantee awakening. There are lots of cases of people who've just stayed in strong states of concentration and then become brahmas, and then they fall from that state. And as we've seen in the jhana wars, that people get very, very attached and very, very proud of their attainments. The Buddha talks about what he calls a person of no integrity, who takes his jhanic attainment. And these attainments can go all the way up to the state of neither perception or not perception. And use that as a basis for exalting himself and disparaging others. Other people don't quite have his level of attainment, his level of jhana, and it becomes a kind a very strong but subtle level of pride. What all this shows is you can't take a technique and hope that it's going to guarantee awakening. What you do with the technique is use it as an opportunity to develop discernment. And the discernment comes from asking questions. You run 
up against a problem in the meditation, and you start questioning things. And hopefully what you do is you start questioning things that you've been taking for granted all along, because after all, the, the insights we're trying to gain are insights about what's happening in the present moment. It's not some place far away that you've never encountered or you've never seen. You've been sitting here in the present moment, aware here in the present moment for who knows how long. Yet there are things you over overlook. And often there are things you totally take for granted. For instance, the idea that if there's pain in the body, it's actually a pain in the body, and it's natural that you're going to suffer. Or if there's a pain in the body, you want to get rid of it. And the discernment comes from questioning those ideas. And not so much in the abstract as you find yourself taking something for granted and you suddenly realize, wait a minute, you have to look at it with the eyes of a stranger, saying, why would I do that? The part of the mind that says, of course you do that, is what you've got to question. And John Vuong talks about how one of the major turning points in his own meditation is when he was suffering from a chronic headache. It lasted for weeks and weeks. So one night he was sitting with a headache, and he suddenly realized, wait a minute, I've been trying to make the headache go away all this time. And that's not the duty. As we chanted just now in the Dhammajaka Sutta, the duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. I mean, that means you have to watch it. Let it be there and watch it to see what happens and to see particularly where it's coming from. What movement of the mind disturbs the, the pain, makes it worse, takes the physical pain and brings it into the mind. There's usually a perception. Again, it's a perception we tend to take for granted about where the pain is, how it relates to the body, how the body is pained. You have to question that. This is what the various teachings on the aggregates and the teachings on the elements are there for to give you some framework for questioning it, say in regard to a physical pain. Suppose that it's in your knee. There are lots of different sensations in your knee. When the pain comes in, it seems to get glommed in with everything else. And then all you can think about is how to push the pain out of the knee, but you can't push it out because it's glued there into everything else in the knee. But suppose you question that perception. Remind yourself, well, there are those four elements, the four physical elements or physical properties that the Buddha talks about. There's earth, water, wind, fire. This is why we use these as objects of meditation for times when you're good, so that when the time comes that pain comes up, you can recognize, okay, which sensations there are the wind sensations, which ones are the fire, i.e. the warmth, which ones are the water, the coolness, which ones are the solid sensations. Now, those are physical sensations. That's one of the aggregates. It's the physical aggregate. It's different from the feeling aggregate. It's when you've got those sensations accounted for, what's left? Where's the pain? And you see it flitting around. You've unglued it. You see it as something separate. And then there's the perception of the pain. You want to learn how to see the pain, the feeling of the pain, as separate from the perception of the pain, and see how the perception is something that rises and passes away, rises and passes away, creates, creates a little bridge between the mind and the physical pain, and then dissolves, and then creates another one. You want to see that. You're not going to see it if you don't question all of this. So we use the practice of mindfulness and we use the practice of concentration to get the mind into a position where it can start asking these questions. You see this in all the great meditation traditions. There's a really nice passage in Dogen where he talks about 
what it means to practice just sitting. And a lot of people assume that he's just saying just that. You just sit there and don't do anything else. But for him, just sitting is asking questions about the just sitting. Is your mind in the body? Is your mind in the sitting? Is the sitting in the mind? Who's doing the sitting? What are your perceptions around that, the act of sitting? Something as simple as that. You learn how to question it. You learn how to raise doubts, things you've been assuming for who knows how long. You learn how to question it. So the idea that someone has found a technique that's guaranteed to work, all you have to do is just put your nose to the grindstone and do the work. That's really not in the, in the spirit of how the Buddha taught. You look at his life, all the major milestones in his quest for awakening turned on questions. Why do I look for happiness in things that change? Of course, everybody looks for happiness in things that change, but why? And so on down the line. All the major turning points in his life come with a question. Sometimes he'd been doing something for six years, like that, all that physical self-torture that he underwent. He said, why am I doing this? Maybe, is there another way? There was, ah, there's still another way that I hadn't tried yet practice of concentration. But the concentration in and of itself didn't do the work. You had to start asking questions. Can I use this concentrated mind to learn different things? And particularly it was when he used his concentration to delve into this issue of why is there suffering? Why is there suffering? Is it possible to put an end to suffering? How might you do that? Those kinds of questions, those kinds of doubts are an essential part of discernment. This is why the Buddha said the mind is purified by discernment. Again, there's the idea that by doing metta practice you burn away your anger, or by doing mindfulness practice, or looking things in terms of the three characteristics, you burn away your old sankaras. The Buddha, the Buddha heaped a lot of ridicule on those ideas, that you could burn away your old karma, burn away your old defilement simply through mindfulness, or simply through patience and endurance. Is how do you know? How many of you have burned up today? Can you measure them? How many defilements did you burn this afternoon? You don't burn them away that way. You see where you've been assuming things, the, the unthinking connections you make, the unthinking assumptions you've been making. You learn to think and say, why? Why that? So this is a process we're going to develop as we practice. And the ultimate stages of insight are going to come when the mind is really, really still. But you find that you'll be developing your discernment by asking these questions along the way. In other words, there are certain problems that you can take care of even with really basic levels of concentration. And then other, level, other levels of problems will pop up as your concentration gets deeper and more refined, your awareness gets more refined. So it goes back and forth like this. In fact, one of the ways of refining your concentration is to figure out, okay, what am I running up against? Why does my mind settle down only so far? What am I still holding on to? Where is the disturbance in this state of stillness? So you want to learn how to bring an element of questioning into your practice. There are times when you want to put that aside so you can just be still or just be mindful. But you have to develop a sense of when it's right to question. There's a story that was circulating around the forest tradition years back about a Western monk who'd gone to one of the monasteries. And Someone had asked him about how far he'd gotten in his practice, and he said, well, I've gotten to the point where I have no more doubts about the Buddha's teaching. Now, in that monastery, the, that statement is a claim for an, at least stream entry. 
And so they reported us to the teacher. And the teacher put his hands over his eyes and said, I have no doubts, I have no doubts, I can't see anything. There's the having no doubts of somebody who just accepts everything and then just does the practice as he's told, doesn't really think about things. And then there's the point of having no doubts when you've explored your doubts, asked questions and found answers, asked unexpected questions, because after all, the, the attainment we're trying to get to is going to be an unexpected attainment. You don't get it by asking your ordinary, everyday questions. You question ordinary things, but you question them in an extraordinary way. And that's when the extraordinary insights are going to arise. So you can't trust simply that mindfulness will do the work, or equanimity will do the work, or jhana will do all the work. You have to have a lively imagination, a lively questioning attitude. This willingness to look all around you so that you can catch movements of the mind in the corner of your eye. Catch yourself doing something that you hadn't realized you were doing. That's what gaining insight into Four Noble Truths is all about. Catch yourself creating stress and suffering where you didn't even realize it was happening. So the mindfulness gets you to the point where you can see these things more clearly. The concentration gets the mind still so that very subtle things become apparent. But they're simply the foundation. It's the discernment. It's that questioning attitude. That's what does the real work. <laughs>